Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. Our guest this week is Jim Barrett. Jim has a Bachelor's of Science from the Auburn University in Agricultural Services, a Master's of Science from Auburn University with an emphasis on physiology of vegetable crops, and a PhD from Michigan State University with an emphasis on physiology of horticulture crops. He was a professor at the University of Florida from 1978 to 2016 with a focus on crop production and controlled environments. A major component of his work was evaluating plant growth hormones, also known as PGRs, and developing new application strategies for greenhouse crops. After retiring from the university, he went on to run Barrett Horticultural Consulting for four years with a focus on crop production and facility planning for Florida medical cannabis producers. He has since retired again and requested that folks not attempt to contact him, but he kindly agreed to come on the podcast to share some of his experience around PGRs and was originally recommended to me by Suzanne Wainwright Evans. I was grateful to catch up with him on the phone and learn more about plant growth hormones and regulators and how they may impact crops like cannabis, as well as what risks may be associated with their use. Now on to the show. Hey, Jim. Well, thanks for coming on the show today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, well, can we start off by uh, giving listeners a little bit of your background in the horticultural world? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, uh, I'm a retired faculty member uh, from the University of Florida. <laughs> spent about uh, 40 years there specializing in crops that are grown in controlled environments, uh, either vegetables or a lot of the flower crops. Um, and one of the main things that I was doing there was looking at plant growth regulators that are real commonly used in greenhouse crops and looking at evaluating chemicals, evaluating formulations, um, application methods and procedures. Uh, some of my work there was directed at trying to reduce the amount of actual chemical that was being used and so, so that the chemical that was, was being used by the commercial growers would be more efficient and there'd be less of it being used, less getting into the environment. The last few years since I retired uh, from University of Florida, I got involved in doing uh, some consulting in the cannabis uh, uh, market in Florida. So I worked with uh, some of the growers there uh, in developing their culture for that environment as well as designing facilities and, and that type of thing. So now I'm, uh, I'm a retired grandfather. Yeah, and I'd like to emphasize you are now fully retired and you're, you're doing this out of your own generosity of your time. You're no longer looking for consulting work and, and there won't be any contact information for you uh, in the podcast section of this podcast. So I'm going to throw that out there for listeners as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I want you to obviously enjoy your time as a grandfather. So... Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's really important. Let's uh, let's dive in talking about you. You'd wanted to start talking a little bit about some of the, the definitions and labeling around, you know, plant growth hormones and plant growth regulators. And, and it sounds like we're going to use those terms sort of synonymously in this in this podcast. So, um, yeah, why don't, why don't we yes. start there? Yeah. Yes. Um, the term plant growth regulator, plant growth regulators is is a pretty broad term, and one of the things that's uh, often associated with plant growth regulators is whether or not they are a pesticide. And so the term pesticide for the federal government, the, pest the EPA, uh, pesticide is a legal issue. <clears throat> it's a legal term. And so the plant growth regulators, uh, from e EPA standpoint, they are classified as pesticides. So in general, in the EPA, you have insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, and plant growth regulators that fall under what they describe as pesticides. So in general, we often think of pesticides as something you're, you're trying to 
a chemical you're trying to kill something. Well, the plant growth regulators, you're not trying to do that. You're trying to, you're doing something to regulate the growth and, and uh, the evolution of a crop that you're producing. So they, from that standpoint, as a user, you have to treat them differently um, and think about them. They're considerably, plant growth regulators are considerably more difficult to manage as a grower than insecticides or fungicides. Um, so that, whether or not a plant growth regulator is a pesticides becomes a legal issue. And especially in the cannabis market, it is a real issue. Well, let me step back. If you're growing tomatoes or geraniums or poinsettias or something, the products that you use there, whether it's a, uh, an insecticide or a growth regulator, comes with a federal label. And so you can't use it unless it has an EPA approved label describing how it should be used. Now, of course, with, in the cannabis market, there's not any federal uh, regulations there. And so there are no uh, real pesticides with federal labels for uh, the cannabis market. Now, it's starting to evolve a little bit more with hemp uh, just because of what's going on there. But primarily uh, for uh, recreational or medicinal cannabis, it's regulated by individual states. And uh, well, most people know what it's like. It varies so much from one state to another and what the state approves. So um, it becomes a real ego, legal issue as to whether or not a PGR can be used from a legal standpoint in any given state or any given market. So that's sort of the legal plant growth regulator situation. It is legally classified as a pesticide. Now, in the PGRs, they're widely varied. Uh, there are you know, several plant hormones, um, and the PGRs in general are either a naturally occurring or a synthetic plant hormone or a chemical that regulates one of the natural plant hormones or the plant. Um, so that's the reason there's some confusion about whether it should be called hormones or not. And, and, and we've sort of just evolved just using, using the term plant growth regulators for a lot of them. Um, so we have uh, hormones like gibberellin, natural hormone in the plant. Um, one, of the or one of the things that gibberellin does in the plant is causes stem elongation. It causes the plants to get larger. Obviously, in cannabis, we must have a lot of gibberellin in that plant because they grow a lot. Then there's a group of chemicals that are synthetic that interfere with the production of gibberellin in the plant. And so these are gibberellin synthesis inhibitors. And that group of chemicals, if you put those on a plant, it will make the plant more compact. It reduces the amount of gibberellin in the plant, and so the plant is shorter. So a product like paclobutrazol is in that category. Um, then you have other hormones like auxins. Auxin, um, IA is the natural auxin, uh, helps uh, cuttings form roots. And so it's pretty common for us to use synthetic auxins, IBA or NAA. Uh, those are products that are chemicals that are in our product like dip and grow to promote rooting on cuttings. Um, Cytokinin is another type of natural plant hormone. Uh, it's involved in promoting lateral bud growth. It's also involved in leaf uh, dieback, turning yellow, uh, senescence of leaves. And so the cytokinin materials, the synthetic cytokinins, or the natural cytokinins that might be found in, in something like uh, uh, seaweed extracts, um, they will promote lateral bud growth, uh, or uh, in some of the synthetic materials, like a, uh, a material that's called 6BA, it's a, it's a synthetic cytokinin, it reduces leaf yellowing. So a plant treated with that, uh, the leaves stay longer, they stay green longer. Um, 
Abscisic acid is a plant hormone that uh, is involved in causing leaves to drop off. Um, it helps uh, plants go dormant in the winter. Uh, and so abscisic acid is something that reduces growth. Um, and there, recently, there are very few abscisic acids that are used in commercial agriculture. But recently, there is it started being used uh, pretty widely of abscisic acid um, for use on grapes and some other uh, crops now. So that the grapes turn uh, turn red or ripen uniformly. And so that makes the harvest easier. So that's just an example of how uh, many of these uh, plant growth regulators are used on uh, food crops. A, um, another one is ethylene. Ethylene is a gas. It's a natural plant hormone produced by the, gas, by the plant normally in response to some kind of stress. Um, <clears throat> and there, there is uh, uh, synthetic products. Uh, one of Ethophon is the name of one that when Treated, when the plants are treated with ethophon, it produces the ethylene gas inside the plant. And then the plant responds like it uh, is uh, responding to ethylene. And the interesting thing about ethylene is just lots and lots of uses for it. Ethylene can be used to cause flowering. And for example, pineapples, almost all the pineapples we consume in the US, the plant was treated with ethylene in the field to get it to, uh, to set fruit. Um, almost all our tomatoes and bananas are treated with ethylene after they were harvested to get them to uh, ripen uniformly. Then there's another set of synthetic materials that block the action of ethylene, either the formation or the action of uh, ethylene in the plant. And uh, some of these are used in the cannabis industry, uh, probably not legally, but um, uh, we can talk about this a little bit more later, I think, but uh, ethylene becomes an important uh, chemical to talk about very often. Then there's some others. Uh, jasmonic acid is one that's being researched quite a bit, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, folks that are looking at plant hormones across the board in all types of crops. So the term plant growth regulator covers a wide base of chemistry or actual chemicals and also a wide base of what we're trying to do in the plant. Uh, so it's pretty varied. So it took a little time answering that question, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty complex issue. Oh, no, that was great. I mean, I'm sure you could, there's college courses just on this topic. I realize it's quite broad. Um, and there's a lot and we're obviously not gonna be able to get into all of it uh, today. But I would right. like to touch on some of the highlights from, you know, our conversations off air here. Um, and one of the things I'd like to start with, because when I think of plant growth regulators, I have in cannabis, I immediately go to um, Paclobutrazole. It's just, it's the one that everyone knows. It's the one that was most commonly used. Uh, people say, you know, I, you can tell if a, if a plant has been treated with Paclobutrazole. Um, can you talk a little bit about it just as a general perspective? And then let's talk about how, you know, in terms of how it affects a plant, just strictly from, um, you know, morphology, pers a morphology aspect. And then let's talk a little bit about what's going on uh, possibly inside, inside the plant. Uh, sure. Yeah. Paclobutrazole. Um, yeah, this is a product that I <laughs> started working with in about 1980. So I have a, long history with paclobutrazole there is a uh, there and so paclobutrazole is a synthetic chemical that blocks the production of gibberellin in the plant so it it is an inhibitor of growth um and in general uh, paclobutrazole there, there are several others in this category uh uniconazole is uh the molecular Structure is very, very similar to paclobutrazole, uh, but uniconazole is more active. Uh, there are others. Domenazide is in the same uh, group of chemicals that block uh, GA synthesis. Uh, Chlormaquat chloride, or some people know it as cyclocell. 
Glyphosate is one of the, or clover one of the more widely used chemicals in agriculture. It's used um, many, many parts of the world on wheat and grain crops to prevent them from lodging, to keep them standing up uh, stronger in the fields. Um, they're also being used on turf grasses and golf courses and stuff quite a bit. Uh, so paclobutazole is the one that is uh, very often used in because it is readily available in agricultural markets. Um, I know some cannabis growers have uh, have tried it and have used it. So it, because it's blocking gibberellin, uh, it causes the inner nodes to be more compact, shorter. Um, there is a very, very strong relationship with the dose amount that is put on. So Let's, uh, if you take the example of a, something like a cannabis plant that has long internodes, so if you would normally uh, be getting internodes that are, uh, as the plant is growing, either vegetative or in flowering, if the internode naturally would be, let's say, five inches long, um, you could put on a paclobutazole amount that might reduce that to three to four inches, or you can put on enough that you reduce it to a half an inch or an inch. Um, and that, that's just, that is just a matter of what the grower is trying to do. Um, and so you can get those kinds of effects. Paxobutrazole is very, very active. Um, the other thing that's important to think about from the cannabis market is that paxobutrazole is very long lasting in the plant. It breaks down into plant degrades very slowly. And the reason I think that is a significant issue is that more and more markets, particularly if you're in a medical market now, all of your product has to be tested uh, before it goes to, to sale. And paclobutazole absolutely will show up in there. It does not break down. Uh, I mean, I know, I know uh, plants that are still showing the growth of paclobut effects of paclobutrazole five to six years after they've been treated. Um, so, so I think that is an that is an that is an issue. To me, that's a that's a very serious issue for many of us in the cannabis market. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And uh, to be clear, it's not it's not legal to use paclobutrazole on cannabis. There's no legal application for it. Um, I've always, you know, being an organic grower, had a lot of negative associations with it, um, but I haven't really researched it too much. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting that you mentioned in terms of how long it stays in the plant. So it's essentially what you're saying is it's systemic. Would I have issues cloning a plant that had been treated with paclobutrozole for say potentially multiple generations? Depends on the concentration. <clears throat> Depends on the rate that was put on. Okay. Now on, on a mother plant, for example, if you put on a little bit too much, I mean, if you put on just a little bit of paclobutazole, maybe you can cut your, the length of your, reduce the length of your cuttings by 25% or 50%. Or you can just stack those nodes right on top of each other and you won't have enough stem there to take a cutting on. Um, and so if you put on too much on a mother plant, you throw the plant away. That's what you end up doing. Well, I think the main reason people are using it is to increase the weight and density of their buds um, or flower. And so uh, that, that's typically what I hear about. Again, this is not an area that I'm terribly knowledgeable on. I've never used it. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, because I, I was worried about safety um, from a you know, medical perspective for people who may be immune compromised. Sure. You know, is it carcinogenic? Uh, those sorts of questions around its use in terms of danger. Uh, your concern from talking to you sounded like more the the highest level of risk is with the applicator, and I think that's interesting. The um, with with these in general, I think yeah. with PGRs. Uh, yes, yeah, and pesticides in general. Uh, this is a little bit of a side note, but if you many of our pesticide regulations that we see. Um, our design, um, and we talk about the end user, the consumer, whereas if you're working with something that's toxic, the person that has the highest exposure is the person who's applying. 
Um, and so if it's something that's toxic, that is the person that has the greatest potential problem with it. And there are a number of applica- a number of examples of that. Uh, uh, actually, I started to use a couple of specific name examples, and I'm, I, I, won't, I, I won't do that uh, because they're sort of in the courts right now and stuff. But uh, in the cannabis market, this spills over to the silver issue. Uh, in the cannabis market where uh, silver products are being used and particularly some of the products that are being recommended for use twice a day until flowering, that person who's applying that silver has a potential, a lot of exposure to uh, you know, a metal that's not very safe for you. So, so that applies to all of our, all of our chemicals. Uh, and back to Paclobutrazole. I don't know of any paclobutrazol formulation. I don't know of any of these synthetic gibberellin uh, inhibitors that have an organic label. Um, almost all of them are labeled for food crops in one application or another. Paclobutrazol is used on uh, a number of the tropical fruits where the trees tend to get real large. They can use the paclobutrazol to keep the trees from getting quite so large. Um, Rice crops in several of the Asian countries are treated with paclobutrazol to keep it shorter and more compact and stronger so that it holds up in the fields until it can be harvested. So they are used on, on food crops. Um, now, the, the paclobutrazol label that most of us see is, the one, is a product called bonsai. And bonsai is used on ornamental crops, flowers. It's not used on food crops. So that label does not have food crops on it, but there are other paclobutrazol labels that do. So if I if I'm buying organic produce, though, that would that would guarantee that these these products are not being used on that crop. Correct. Uh, uh, well, you said use the term guarantee. Uh, well, in general, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to the yeah, to the best cool. of our knowledge, uh, you know, assuming that someone's not cheating the system, if you're if you're buying certified organic, then um, these products are not allowed in that. There's no there's no synthetic plant growth regulators that are allowed for use in organic production. Correct. That, that's that's correct. Okay, so I just want to warning warning to avoid you know uh, wheat crops that haven't been treated with. Uh, Chlormaquat, where you, you you know you buy an organic product. Yeah. Yes, that's true. But but these things have been being used on our organic produce for decades. It sounds like um, from what you're what you're saying, like in the case of paclobutrazol. Uh yes, yeah. Okay. Um, and there's no research that you're aware of regarding, say, combustion versus, uh, you know consumption of uh, some of these chemicals, which is, is something I wanted to highlight as well. Um, there, is there any yeah, research you know, to show what happens when you burn paclobutrazol in the leaf tissue, you know, in the case of cannabis versus, you know, eating it in, a, say, a, a rice crop or something like that? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, uh, you know, in general, there wouldn't... Uh, for a company who's selling the product who has to pay for all this testing, uh, there would not be a need for them to do that kind of testing un- unless they're selling it right now into uh, tobacco, for example. And this group of chemicals, none of these are used on tobacco. Um, and so, no, I don't know of any testing to see what would what the response would be on uh, any of these products that are, uh, you know, are burned. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to a couple other uh, sure. you know, plant growth regulators um, besides, you know, gibberell in- inhibitors. Let's talk a little bit about triacontinol because you and I were talking about alfalfa because we were, uh, we were talking about maybe, you know, organic sources and you shared some stuff that I, I wasn't aware of regarding, you know, triacontinol. Yeah, uh, tricontinol is, uh, uh, gosh, uh, I was at Michigan State in uh, 
Oh, it was about 70, uh, 76 or something like that, working on my PhD. And one of the faculty members I was working with uh, made the discovery of tricotinol. And it's, it's a really interesting uh, molecule. It's an interesting uh, plant growth regulator. Alfalfa is where it's been found in the highest concentrations. Um, I don't know of any commercial tricotinol products. I, I, you, can, you can go to a, a chemical supply uh, company and buy tricotinol, but that'll be in a real concentrated form. And tricotinol is a, in a concentrated form is very, very difficult to handle. It breaks down very readily. Um, I mean, even if you, uh, for example, uh, handle a spoon and get a little bit of acid off of your uh, fingers and then use that spoon to to handle the tricotinol, it'll break the tricotinol down and, and so lose its activity. Um, but where tricotinol has shown to, to really have its best effect is using alfalfa as a mulch around plants. And uh, the original work was actually an accident using tricotinol as a mulch uh, and seeing how much uh, you know, promotion and growth occurred in some of the grain crops. Um, so I think the, the place for that is if, the, you know, if, a, if a cannabis producer has access to alfalfa, uh, using that as a uh, either incorporated into the soil or as a uh, as a mulch uh, for in-ground plants would be the place that there would be a real use there. And so sometimes it works real well. So like a lot of the plant hormones are like this. Sometimes it works real well and sometimes it doesn't work very well. There's not any negative effects, but when it works, it, uh, the effects on plant growth are dramatic. Yields, the things that are increased. So if I were to, as an organic grower, throw some alfalfa meal in my soil, I'm probably not getting a lot of tricontinol benefits because it's probably breaking down um, yes. from, what, from what I'm getting. Or, um, you know, does the pelletization process or even the meal process with, with alfalfa affect uh, tricontinol? Do we need, are, are you, when you talk about mulching, are we talking about you know, uh, something more stemmy, more like the original plant crop itself. Yeah. Now this this goes beyond my real experience because I have not worked on tricotinol since you know looking at it in Michigan State. Um, at, and so what I'm familiar with is getting the the performance from using um, the alfalfa plants as mulch. Okay. And okay. so what happens when it's uh, Pelletized and, and dried and that kind of thing. I don't know. Okay, so th we could do our so own. I'm, I'm, sure, research I'm sure there's some folks that are looking. I'm sure there's some folks that are looking at tricotinol now that have have much more update information than I do. Yeah, that's great. Well, can we go back? We, you know, I don't. One thing we didn't really even talk about what what is what tricotinol does. Like, what are the the benefits or uh, in terms of a uh, plant growth? Uh, it promotes photosynthesis, promotes photosynthesis, it promotes growth, makes the plants more efficient. So when you say promotes photosynthesis, would it allow the plant to take in more light as in it could handle higher light intensity or that it allows it to be more efficient with the amount of light it's receiving? Uh, both. <laughs> okay. Both. Yeah. Um, and CO2. That's that's the other one. It's more efficient with, uh, of course, if you're an outside grower, you're locked into natural CO2 levels and, and the plant is more efficient. You know? Yeah. No, that's interesting. I, it, might, it might be worth trying some trials, you know, some controlled environment trials using alfalfa as a mulch. I'd be curious to do a little research or learn more about that. I, I wonder if there's any uh, negatives in terms of pest habitat and, and other things like that, that might offset, but, um, I'll have to talk to Suzanne and, and kind of pick her brain on that one. Right. Right. Yeah. Interesting though. Uh, can we, you know, you touched on ethylene. That's one that there were a lot yeah. of questions about, you know, when I think of ethylene, I think of bananas and, and ripening, um, 
but I, I don't know a lot about it. How would one potentially use ethylene gas to their benefit when we talk about cannabis or, or detriment? Are there things to avoid in terms of ripening or how this gas works? Yeah, well, ethylene, um, I've never treated a cannabis plant with ethylene. Um, um, and there is a, uh, a product called Ethophon that can be used and is used on a number of crops to spray the ethophon and then inside the plant it's converted to ethylene. So it would not be difficult to apply, basically apply ethylene to a cannabis plant. The responses that I would anticipate getting would be enhanced leaf yellowing, uh, senescence to leaves. Um, if you put it on a little bit too early, you can knock off flowers. Um, and so timing on ethylene and its application in plants is a, is a real issue. <laughs> now, one of the things that ethylene would do um, is ethylene would tend to make a plant more likely be female. So where you're typically, where you, I think this is a little bit of a stretch, but where you're having a problem with hermaphrodites, um, Ethylene potentially would prevent that problem. Okay. Um, but I, I anticipate that you see too many negative effects with ethylene itself. The place uh, for ethylene in cannabis is the products that um, are preventing uh, the plant from producing ethylene. Ethylene is involved in sex expression. So in cannabis, a number of other plants, if you block the ethylene natural production of ethylene in the plant, it will shift from producing female flowers to male flowers. And so that's where uh, there are a number of cannabis folks and particularly the feminized hemp seed that's, uh, you know, become so popular in the market. That tends to be produced uh, using a product that blocks the natural ethylene production in the plant. Hmm. Okay. So, um, you know, I don't guess we need to get into how you produce feminized seed, but you need to take a female plant and uh, get male flowers and thus pollen produced um, on that on that plant. And you do that by blocking the ethylene production in the plant. Okay. Okay. So when I think of ethylene, I think of... Um, you know, post-production, like I assume that, you know, after we harvest the bud and it's in a jar, ethylene is probably building up in that jar. So when we burp the jar, we're going to lower the ethylene levels in a jar. And then when we put the lid back on, that process would restart. And that's something we're kind of naturally regulating in, in the curing process. Is that, is that way off base? Um, well, I, anticip I anticipate at that point that once you dry that material, you're not going to get any more ethylene really produced by it. So as so it's, as it's drying, though, is what I'm wondering. I mean, maybe not once it's cured, but as it's going through that sort of curing process, like t moving towards homeostasis in terms of the, the leaf tissue, is, is there still ethylene being produced or is, at that point is it done? It, the ethylene, the ethylene production is going to going to be decreasing, just like all of the other. Um, when when that tissue is first cut, there is a big blast of ethylene that's produced. That's a natural thing that the plant does. Uh, when it's wounded, it produces a lot of ethylene. But then, as as it's drying out, the amount of ethylene that's, that is produced will be dramatically reduced. So that, that and kind I, of and, takes me in a different direction. Like when we go in and say prune our flowering room uh, and remove a bunch of material and we're making a lot of plant wounds, would that be a good time then to potentially um, do an air exchange to remove any ethylene? Um, or is that probably insignificant in terms of the amount of ethylene that's actually being that, production, it, produced it, in a room? Yeah, that step would be, I think the ethylene is very important, but most of that is sort of internal ethylene that's in, in the tissues and moving around. Oh, okay. And, and I think, I, actually, I anticipate that um, 
and particularly as we get close up to flower, closer to flowering and harvest, that a lot of what we're doing is stimulating stress in that plant so that it will produce more oils, more terpenes, and ethylene is involved in that. So, so I think our wounding of the plant at that point is making the plant respond like it's being attacked by insects. Mm -hmm. And so ethylene is a natural factor there. Uh, the uh, the jasmonic acid is a natu natural uh, part of that process. And so we're actually benefiting from that ethylene production when we wound the plants at that stage. Okay. Yeah. I mean, plant stress, I think, is, is a fascinating topic when we talk about cannabis. So essentially... It's pretty complex, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, I've always been under the impression with cannabis that, you know, with all the facilities that I visited, that uh, we have no issues creating plant stress. So I'm always on the side of <laughs> reducing plant stress because it seems like every facility has something. You know, there's no perfect grow out there, at least as far as I I've seen. Um, but I do wonder about targeted plant stress. Like I've heard of tomato farmers flooding their fields with salinity. I've heard of other, with other food crops, you know, targeted plant stress to increase fruit production or, uh, you know, fl flavonoids, sure. terpene expression. Um, have you seen any research in that in regards to cannabis or any direction in, re in relation to our conversation that you think might be interesting? Well, the, I, the the research that has been done clearly shows that the stress uh, that you know tend to apply to uh, cannabis and the way it's grown is stimulating terpenes. Um, which, but I think that's as far as we really go in our information about how to control it. We're doing it, but we're not controlling it very well. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, our high salt stress. Uh, if we're drought stressing, definitely the leaf removal, um, even the air that we're blowing over the plants is, causes ethylene formation. Um, and so we're doing a lot to stress the plants, but we're not doing very much in a controlled setting. So I think as the industry and the information evolves, we're going to be finding out a, which are the best stressors mm -hmm. and when to apply them. Um, and right now, I haven't seen any research that really tells us that. I think I think there are a lot of individuals that they feel like what those works works best in their facility, but we we don't understand you know the why behind it. Yeah, I mean, I've even seen guys throw ice cubes all over their soil to you know prior to harvest to freeze the plant, um, you know, and, and shock it that way. Uh, you right, name it, right. I've seen it, I feel like, on, in forums <laughs> and stuff. But uh, I, I, you're right, we don't know, and it's, it's very uncontrolled. And I think, it's, I think it's interesting. And the other thing to bring up is we, we have a massive genetic diversity in cannabis when we talk about the selection of cultivars that we're dealing with, where you don't have that in other food crops for the most part. Um, and that's going to affect things too, I would think, and we have to account for that as well. All, with all the plant hormones, the... The plant diversity is a big issue. Uh, what works best or the dose or the timing of the dose in one strain, if I'm working with tomatoes or geraniums or poinsettias or whatever, the, the, uh, what, what, well, the cannabis folks call them strains and in agriculture we call them uh, varieties or cultivars. But from one to another, the dose and the timing is different. The optimum dose and timing is different. And uh, cannabis is one of the most diverse mm -hmm. plants from a crop standpoint that, uh, that you can find. And so there's a huge variation that we don't understand yet. Yeah, I think that's an important thing to remind people of. Um, yeah. <laughs> because what may be perfect for one you know, strain or cultivar it may have an entirely different effect. Because when I think of, uh, you know, when you talk specifically about gibberella, and I can think of some plants that are already quite compact relative to others that are, you know, huge internodal spacing. Um, and there's, there are big, and, you know, research on other crops that tell me that there's big differences in the level of GA that's produced by those different strains. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, let's... Uh, Let's move on to another one here. We talked about ethylene. Uh, jasmonic acid or jasminate is another one that um, 
I've seen in relation to roses. Ted, Ted, Ted before we get off of that, and, and I'm not following time, uh, but under the ethylene, we did not really directly talk about silver thiosulfate. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So for blocking ethylene, um, silver thiosulfate is a chemical that um, a lot of folks that are producing cannabis seed are using to produce that male plant from a female uh, clone. Um, silver thiosulfate is, um, is a chemical that's been around for a long time and its effect on ethylene is really pretty well known. Um, they're, they're, uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Uh, with a, you know, a product with a marijuana leaf on it and, and that kind of thing. But there is no labeling. I, just, that, I mean, it's technically it is a pesticide, and there's no there's no federal or state labeling that I know of for silver thiol sulfate. Um, there's information on how to make it yourself, um, that kind of thing. But it is not a really safe product. That silver is in there, and um, from an environmental standpoint, uh, if you're using silver thiol sulfate spraying it in a greenhouse or a growth room or something you're getting it into the environment um, so in my mind it's not a very safe alternative um, there's another product that this is this is a, this other product is called ethyl block or MCP is the molecule MCP um, it, it is a labeled product for use on agricultural crops it's not labeled on cannabis uh, but it is a, a safer product. Um, there is another product that breaks, uh, that stops ethylene, and uh, it's called EDG, and there is a commercial product that's used on apples called Retain, uh, that you know, if, if you're going <laughs> to do something that's, well, you know, if, if you're doing something and, that, and none of it's going to be labeled, I think you'd be better off using a safer product than a silver product. Um, and, uh, you know, I know that there are some people that are talking about using a colloidal silver uh, for the same effect. And to me, that's the least efficient. It requires much more silver to do it and is more dangerous. Um, so anyway, that's my, that's my two cents worth there. <laughs> Yeah, that's not an area I'm very knowledgeable about. You know, as an organic person, I think, oh, silver, it's a metal. Uh, that sounds like a good option. But, you know, organic doesn't necessarily equate safe. Um, there's a lot of organic compounds that are quite dangerous. <laughs> and uh, I think that's an important yeah. distinction that you mentioned there. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, oh, and Gibberellin. Gibberellin, uh, Gibberellin products are widely used in the markets and in, in agricultural markets. And they will tend to do the same thing. They're not quite as efficient as the silver thiol sulfate, but they will they'll do the same thing and promote male flowers. Okay. Yeah. So I, I want to come back to, uh, you know, we talked a little about paclobutrazol, even when we're talking about safety. You know, I did do a little quick Googling and saw there was some research showing potential liver damage in rats related to paclobutrazol. Um, obviously growers that were using it, um, and it was in a lot of these hydroponic products, uh, you know, found one thing to realize is that people are putting stuff off label in these hydroponic nutrient products or they have in the past. Yeah. And that's the big challenge, you know, so, and these are pretty major companies, you know, everyone knows the names of these companies and they were able to make a lot of money by selling these because if you can, it, it makes growing plants or growing cannabis a heck of a lot easier if you can cut down your flowering times that saves you a lot of money you know in other products I, I know this isn't maybe a pgr but i wanted to talk a little bit about eagle 20 um, when we're talking about some of these potential you know products that people are using in cannabis that are not necessarily legal um, did you want to touch it all on do you have any familiarity with that product at all in terms of uh, you know, I'm familiar enough with it that I, I know what the situation is. And this this is a problem in the marijuana 
uh, cannabis market. Um, and 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 it gets and it gets you know back to not knowing what's in some of these things that are purchased and used. And it's easy to do the marketing. It's easy to create really glossy brochures and bright labels and all that kind of stuff and and the marketing uh the marketing can make the the product sound like that it's you know the best thing since sliced bread um and you don't know everything that's in there and you don't know what is you know what's what's there and so that's where I come from traditional agriculture. I like labels. I like information that is legal, describes what the product is, what it'll do, you know, how to use it, and identifies everything that's in there. Um, and so the sooner we can get to that and, you know, 100% in the marijuana market, uh, the better. Uh, there's still just lots of material that you can buy from Amazon or down at, uh, you know, the big box store or where, wherever, um, online sources that uh, I describe it sometimes as the marketing is better than the product itself. Uh, and that that's unfortunate. So I would really encourage, you know, everyone that's uh, – that's growing cannabis to really pay attention to the products that they're using and making making sure that they're getting better. That's that's the important thing to me, is that we're always moving in a, in a better direction. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. What, 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 yeah. I, I yeah. guess I want to touch um, on that really quickly, Jim, because you know, as as a grower, to be able to use P, PGRs and you know, Michael Butanol, which we're talking about when you say something like Eagle 20, uh, it makes it really easy to grow. The plant's finishing sooner, it's denser, you know, applying a systemic pesticide allows us to not have to worry about things like mites or things like uh, powdery mildew. Sure. It makes it really easy for the grower to grow a healthy looking plant. But when we talk about the risk associated with it, you know, I want to highlight that one, it's risky to the, to the grower because they're exposing themselves to higher levels of these toxins. They're probably not doing it in a manner that's safe. This is all off label and not researched um, and, they, and they haven't been trained. They don't have a pesticide license to apply these things. Uh, so yep. there's a risk yep. to them, but then the risk to the consumer, like with Michael Butanol, you know, I've read that, you know, it is used on a lot of our, our food crops and that's something that, that I think growers use in defense of its use in cannabis. However, there is no research. It's not allowed on tobacco. There is no research in terms of exposure versus inhalation uh, or via inhalation or absorption through the skin, um, as well as, um, you know, when we when we burn it, supposedly what I've read from you know people smarter than me is that it releases uh, a highly toxic gas or, or form of cyanide. And so I, I worry that people, growers look at these PGRs or, you know, some of these pesticides that are systemic and say, oh, well, they're used on apples or they're used on mangoes or rice. They're, they're safe. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why when you say, you know, this, this thing about labels, I think that's so important. I don't think we can highlight that enough um, because these labels are, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars behind the creation and testing of what they're allowed to put on this label. Yeah, and that's, I mean, sometimes the government regulations are good for us. Uh, for a, any pesticide product to get a label for cannabis, a federal label for cannabis, it has to be tested, residues have to be established, all of that kind of thing. And so it would be a much, much safer situation for us. Um, even if you're just talking about organics, see, that's one of the current problems with the organic certification it's a federal certification and you can't get that you can call it organic or natural or something mm -hmm. but it's not tested to be that yeah. uh, so and if you really get an organic i mean if you go to a grocery store and you buy an organic tomato it has a little label on there that's you know it says that it's been certified as being organic well an independent agency has to come in and evaluate what that farmer and producer is doing to make sure that they're following all the rules. And so if you're just selling any kind of product and saying that it's natural and it's safe or it 
just using the term organic without using the official label, there's no one that's actually inspecting that and certifying it. Uh, so that's that's where I think as we move in that direction of more federal regulation um, in this in this space would be a lot better off. Absolutely, you really it really comes down to knowing your grower and. There are certifications out there, like uh, I don't know if you've heard of Certified Kind with Andrew Black, where he is following the same standards uh, that the NOP uses and, and uh-huh. actually doing okay. and doing testing. So that's great. The, the problem is there's just not enough, um, oh, I, I guess not enough public awareness around it, you know, um, to where that certification has as much value as I think it should. You know, that, that Certified Organic sticker um, when we go into the grocery store, it carries a lot of weight, at least for someone like me, I'm putting a lot of trust behind it compared to, yeah. you know, I'm paying what 50 cents, a dollar or more, uh, for my more produce for it, yeah. for it yeah. you know, and I realize that I'm paying for that certification. I'm paying for that company to do that work and know that my product is that what I'm eating is grown in a way that fits with my, you know, my ethics or my morality. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely right that that is a challenge in cannabis right now. Yeah. So, uh, so Tad, one of the things that we might want to discuss just a little bit, I think you mentioned that you had some questions about the uh, temperature and affecting growth and what we refer to as the difference in day and night temperature. Yes. I'll take a moment to do that. Absolutely. So the three things I want to cover with you before signing off, I know we're running a little long here, okay. um, was, was that topic, the, how adjusting temperatures may work similar to you know, some of these PGRs and how that might be useful for people. I wanted to talk about jasmonic acid. And then I wanted to talk about stability because people are making a lot of uh, you know, ferments or um, applying organic products like kelp meal, for example, and thinking that they're getting these various PGRs or alfalfa and how I want to talk about how stable these things actually are to know if they're, if they're potentially even in the final product to say, yeah, we are getting some of these natural PGRs or no, they're probably, you know, disappearing before they ever really have an effect on the plant. So those are the three things. Yeah. Where would you like to start? Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, all right. First diff. Um, okay. And diff is basically uh, short for difference. And, and so it's the difference in the day and night temperature. And in a natural situation, nights are cooler than the, than the days are. So there is a positive difference. Let's say it's uh, 65 degrees at night, 75 de- degrees during the day. So that's a positive 10 degree diff. You lower that difference and even going to a negative diff, you create shorter internodes, smaller plants, very, very similar to a paclobutrazole effect. So in a greenhouse or in a, any controlled environment, you have the capability of controlling your day and night temperatures. And so instead of getting a 10 degree difference, you lower it to say two degrees or zero, you'll see a much more compact plant. Hmm. You can take it one step further. I'm sorry? I wasn't aware of that. That's really interesting. So the smaller the diff, the smaller the internet. Yeah, and you can take it one step further is that if you make your nighttime temperature cooler, I mean warmer than your daytime temperature. So let's say your nighttime temperature is 70 degrees and your day temperature is 68 degrees, you'll have an even more compact plant. Hmm. I mean, there's some challenges around that with lighting and, and the there, way there's things. Some, there are definitely some, <laughs> yeah, there's some, definitely some challenges. Now, particularly in a greenhouse kind of setting where you're doing natural ventilation, there is an important period that is about one hour before sunrise and two to three hours after sunrise. And that's when in a 24 hour period, the plant is most responsive to this differences in temperature. So there's a technique that's sometimes called the morning dip. So that if you're going through the night and your temperature is 70 degrees during the night, about an hour before sunrise, lower the temperature to something like 65 and then keep it low 
for about three hours after sunrise and then it go, let it go up to a natural day temperature. That will give you the most compact plant you can get. Wow. Now, there's, there's quite a bit of information on this. We can't go into all of it, but there's, I, I sort of threw the big picture at you real quick there. Uh, you can just do a, a internet search for uh, plant response to diff or difference in day and night temperature, and you'll find quite a bit of information. This is pretty widely used in, uh, in flower crops that are used in greenhouses. Um, and, and that's a good technique. Now, I have not done it on cannabis, and I don't know anyone who is. I'm guessing there's some folks out there. I know some consultants that are very familiar with this. So I'm guessing that there are some folks that are playing with it. Uh, but it definitely works, and cannabis looks like it would be a, a perfect crop to, to try this on. Now, at the same time, uh, everyone's dealing with humidity issues. You're, you'll, if so, it works best if you're in a situation where you can manage humidity at the same time, sure. uh, at least on cannabis. Yeah. That's really um, interesting. I, I hope uh, to hear from people that, that are, that do more research on this and experiment. Um, yeah, that, yeah I think it that's definitely works. Definitely yeah. works. Great. And one of the nice things about it compared to using paclobutrazol is when you put paclobutrazol in the plant, when you put it in the system, it's there. This diff concept, you can manipulate it and give it two or three days one way and two or three days another way. So you can, you know, if you want the plants a little taller, you can give it, make it a little more positive. If you want them compact, you, you know, and they'll respond within two or three days. Very so cool. So you can turn it on and off. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, anything more on that or, or do you want to jump into uh, jasmonic acid? Jasmonic acid. Um, yeah, this is, this is one that's really interesting, and there's tons and tons of research being done by, you know, botanists who, who are uh, studying stress and plant hormones. Um, and I, I know in the cannabis industry, there's, there's quite a bit of interest in it. Uh, jasmonic acid is involved in stress response, um, response of the plant to natural stresses uh, like temperature and drought stress, but also the response to insects. And so it is part of the process of the plant uh, adjusting the way it's growing to account for the stress that it's under. And there's some potential, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, that I think that in what we're doing and the way we're stressing plants, we are causing the plant to be producing its own jasmonic acid <clears throat> as it would naturally do. Um, in general, jasmonic acid reduces growth. That's in general. Um, but it's also working in the plant, it's working with the other hormones, the gibberellins and ethylene and IA auxins, uh, to adjust that. And as the stress level goes down, the growth might go back up and, and those kinds of things. Uh, there there is a jasmonic acid product being sold on Amazon. I mean, you can go buy it, uh, but there's no information about how to use it, doses, timing, those kinds of things. And I have seen, I've seen evidence that jasmonic gets, uh, you know, works on producing uh, plants treated with jasmonic acid produce more terpenes. Um, but then there's that whole issue of the huge number of terpenes and how much you apply and, and, and things like that and how it affects some different uh, strains. Um, and so right now, uh, um, I don't know that anyone can tell you this is what to do to use and be successful with jasmonic acid on cannabis. Um, it looks like there's definitely some potential there, but like most of the hormone things, there's so many ways that um, that the hormones interact with all the other conditions, how much fertilizer we're using, how much water. Um, it may be that we're already stressing the plant so much that if you go out and start treating with jasmonic acid, you get more negative effect. Hmm. Uh, so that's, that's always a concern too. So while I think it is an interesting area to look at, it's not one that, I, you know, 
if someone feels like they're an early adopter, they might go, you know, trial it a little bit, but I wouldn't go out there and, you know, bet the farm on it, that well, kind of thing. Well, Jim, is there any legal uses of jasmonic acid on cannabis? And I, I don't know a lot about it. How safe is it? I've seen, you know, jazz spay, spray for roses, um, but, you know, how how safe is it for compared to, say, Paclobutrazol or some of these other PGRs? Or is they all kind of um, in that same category of just untested and we don't really know the safety of them? absolutely untested. Yeah, I don't know of any uh, jasmonic acid product that's being sold in agriculture that has gone through the sort of rigors of testing that uh, EPA requires. Okay. Um, but my feeling is that it's it's going to be relatively safe, but, you know, arsenic is a natural product too. Absolutely. Um, uh, so we need to know more. We absolutely need to more need to need to know more. But it's definitely one that uh, you know I think has some uh, potential uses for us. It may be that, that the system that we're currently using isn't the best system. It might be better for us to do some more things to reduce stress early in the crop and then stress it at the end with the jasmonic acid treatment, for example. Um, and that might be a better production system. I would anticipate as you go up in scale and start use, doing larger production areas and trying to do more exact timing, that getting away from our current stressors uh, will make it more uniform. And then if we can apply a naturally uh, occurring material uh, near the end of the crop, to, you know, uh, jump that terpene production, that's probably a better system. And we might find that it's better to just use salt stress, you know, and, and, and you know, two weeks before harvest, something like that as being the way, the best way to produce the crop. Mm -hmm. uh, or light stress. Uh, we just don't know, don't know right now. I, I think the biggest takeaway I've gotten from my conversation with you, uh, today is is just un, an understanding of what these pgrs are and how how they work inside of a plant would give a grower a a better understanding in terms of potential manipulation of you know plant growth and plant stress um so i i think just a better understanding of botany and uh you know some of these chemical reactions uh, is useful for a grower I, I think that's important. I think that's important. You know, I, with my flower growers that I worked with for years <laughs> and doing grower seminars on how to use uh, the inhibitors like Paxlobutazol and that kind of thing, I, I told the audience over and over again, if the question they ask me is what dose to put on or what rate to use, that my answer to that is don't use it. Because that is the last thing you decide after you look at all of the other inputs that you have. Your the differences in your temperatures, your light levels, the irrigation, the strain that you're growing, all of that. Then you decide how much to put on. And so it's it's there. It, there's a lot of potential, but it also requires uh, a, a more technical growing strategy. I guess uh, is a way to put it. Yeah. And, and once again, none of these, uh, you know, none of these chemicals that we mentioned are legal to use on cannabis. And we're not certainly not encouraging growers to go out there and use them. Um, uh, right. You know, right. So and, I, I, and, that's the most important thing <laughs> I want to highlight. Yeah. Yeah. And with, with cannabis, it absolutely, um, you know, right now in the U.S. at least, is look at your state requirements and what's legal to use in that state. It varies from state to state. If you're across the border in Canada, the same absolute chemical may be legal in Canada and not in anywhere in the U.S. or vice versa. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's it's all it's all gets down to local regulations is, and uh, and all, and if you you know and then that that whole issue I think more we're going to be doing more and more testing uh, and some of these things really last for a long time in the plant. You know, honestly, my motivation as an organic grower with this podcast was not only to educate people, but to hopefully discourage them if they were using them and realize some of the potential risks um, associated 
with use, not just to themselves, but to the consumer. Um, at the end of the day, I know some people are, are going to still continue to apply these things, but at least maybe they'll have a little more education and, and hopefully consider not using them in their grow if they are, because frankly, it's illegal. And I don't, I personally don't believe it to be safe, but we don't ultimately know. And that, that's the biggest thing um, the, 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 for people to be aware of. So let's, yeah, let's, yeah. let's dive into this last question so you can get back to your, uh, get back to your day. Uh, I, I wanted to know about stability of these PGRs because like, for example, you know, I used to make willow water to try and extract IBA. You know, I've experimented with kelp meal and seaweed extract powder and uh, alfalfa, you know, trying to potentially capture natural sources of these uh, sure. PGRs. Uh, how stable are these? Like I wasn't aware of triacontinol being um, so unstable to where I probably, you know, I was getting other benefits from alfalfa, but probably not the triacontinol. So like, what about some of these other ones? Yeah. Uh, you know, it varies a lot. The oxen materials that, um, that are used for rooting, uh, the naturally occurring oxens tend to be very unstable. A little bit of exposure to light, uh, you know, and they break down. Um, that's sort of the reason that we don't use naturally uh, natural IAA in uh, in propagation. We use the synthetic materials that uh, that hold up longer. Um, and even yeah, it, you know it varies. And and I haven't looked into this area. That's a, that's definitely an area that I have not uh, not looked at. So I can't I can't answer your question directly, uh, other than it varies a lot. Well, I think you did, you know, we make assumptions as growers that because we hear, for example, you know, with alfalfa or, or with kelp that it contains auxins and gibberellins and cytokines that we're, when we apply it, we're getting them. But uh, essentially what you're saying is that potentially these, these PGRs are not as stable and they may not be making it. We may not be getting that effect. We may be getting other effects, but not necessarily the purported benefits of PGRs. Is that fair to say? Uh, it, it, that, I think that's very fair to say. Okay. Well, the I, naturally occurring material, the, the natural occurring hormones in the plant tend to break down fast. That's one of the ways that they regulate, the plant regulates what's going on. Um, and so when you, and then when you get into, uh, you know, a system where you're applying them natural products, you've got that same issue a little bit. What is the processing done? Uh, you know, things like the auxins that, that break down at high temperatures, uh, you know, the processing, uh, you know, may, may break it down. And so you, it may not be very high levels in the final product. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I, I learned quite a bit of stuff about PGRs that I wasn't aware of. And, uh, yeah, I really thank you for, for sharing this. Sure. I'm glad to do it. Glad to do it. Hopefully it's been helpful for everyone. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, again, I'd like to mention, Jim, you are fully retired. Uh, you're not currently doing any consulting. Uh, so for folks that listen to this, uh, please don't attempt to contact Jim. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's enjoying his retirement and, uh, I'll, I'll let him talk to my granddaughter. There we go. There we go. Well, <laughs> we'll have a wonderful rest of your day and, uh, thanks again. All right. Thanks, Dan. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye. That was Jim Barrett, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. Don't forget to check out the podcast page at www.kisorganics.com. Just click on the Learn tab, then Podcast. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave us a comment or review on whatever platform you listen on. I do take the time to read them all and appreciate the feedback. You can also follow us on Instagram at, at KISorganics to stay up to date on the latest podcast releases and information. Thanks for listening.